As the winds of change blew through Europe, by June 1940, Nazi Germany had invaded almost every country to the north, south, east and west of its borders, terrorizing civilians, obliterating cities and driving back the Allied troops that tried to halt their advance. It seemed that little stood in the way of the Nazis and their total domination of the continent. When Adolf Hitler marched victoriously into Paris, the world could do nothing more than look on in total dismay. But while Nazi forces flooded into France and Hitler's commanders began to enjoy the fruits of their success, there was one nation that refused to capitulate to German domination. Across the Channel, Great Britain was simply not prepared to contemplate peace with Nazi Germany. As the planes of the Third Reich began to swarm towards British airspace, Adolf Hitler was about to discover that he faced an entire population determined to defend its beaches, towns and cities, no matter what the cost. While the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill rallied the public to fight to the bitter end, the Battle of Britain got underway. Hitler's military supremacy faced its biggest challenge to date. The story of this most historic battle and the brave souls who fought to defend their island protecting it from a regime that threatened freedom and democracy in Europe marked a turning point in a war that had so far seemed impossible for the Allies to win. And as the spirit of Dunkirk remained strong, it was the extraordinary bravery of those who struggled through the dark days when Britain stood alone that would ultimately save not only the United Kingdom, but also their fellow allies from the overwhelming force of Hitler's Third Reich. From the terror of the Blitz to the extraordinary battles fought in the air, not forgetting, of course, the events unfolding further afield in the Far East and the deserts of North Africa, this chapter will chart the first real evidence of the world fighting back against Hitler and his axis of evil. In 1938, the British public had watched King George VI lay a wreath on the cenotaph in memory of the thousands of lives that had been lost in the First Great War. At that stage, few people realized how close the nation now was to facing bitter conflict, and that the peace the world had cherished for almost two decades was about to be shattered. However, from the rubble and ruins of the First World War, new and dangerous forces were beginning to emerge. The Italian dictator Mussolini was eager to create a new Roman Empire. Adolf Hitler was rallying the German people to support his demands for more territory and his dreams of a world run by an Aryan master race. When the Nazis had marched into Czechoslovakia in March 1939, Past allies, France and Great Britain, were left clinging precariously to the comfort of tradition. The French president, Albert Le Brun, made a state visit to Britain, reassuring the public that the established empires were more than a match for the new dictators. But it was soon clear that fine words and rash promises would never be enough to withstand the terrible storm that was brewing on the continent. As nations were toppled like dominoes across Europe, it was evident that peace was not a word that had any place in Hitler's vocabulary, and the only option was to stop taking a defensive line and go on the attack. Winston Churchill, a statesman who had been no stranger to conflict his whole life long, 
was also a descendant of one of the greatest military commanders Britain had ever known. Lord John Churchill, who had crushed the forces of the French king, Louis XIV, at the Battle of Blenheim in 1704. Winston, as a child, had been fascinated by war strategies and battle manoeuvres, and proudly upheld the position of school fencing champion. After attending the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst, he graduated 8th out of 150 cadets and was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the 4th Queen's Own Hussars in 1895. From the Boer War in South Africa to battles in Cuba and India, Churchill travelled far and wide, sometimes fighting and sometimes writing news reports, and on occasions doing both simultaneously. It was clear that the young man seemed to be most at home when he was at the heart of the action, even when he became a politician as the 20th century dawned, from skirmishes with the suffragettes in 1910 to gangster battles in the East End, it seemed that wherever there was a fight to be fought, Churchill was never far away. Nevertheless, as the First World War loomed on the horizon, Churchill's actions were frequently controversial and not always successful. When he was appointed First Lord of the Admiralty in November 1914, his strategy of securing a sea route to Russia by capturing Constantinople proved problematic from the start. The campaign was an unmitigated disaster and thousands of troops, many of whom were volunteers from New Zealand and Australia, were slaughtered at Gallipoli as the attack commenced. Always unpopular in political circles due to outspokenness, Churchill was made the scapegoat for the disaster, although others had equal responsibility. The first Lord of the Admiralty was removed from his post in disgrace, and Churchill would find himself in the political wilderness for the next two decades, before fate finally granted him another opportunity to prove himself to the British public. When the Battle of France commenced in May 1940, Winston Churchill, as Britain's new Prime Minister, had the chance to win back the credibility he'd lost as a result of the events at Gallipoli. It was a chance he was determined to exploit to the full. On May 2nd, as Winston accepted the role of Prime Minister, he told the nation that he had nothing to offer but his blood, toil, tears and sweat the intention of the new government was to wage war by land, sea and air. War with all our might and with all the strength God has given us. His skillful rhetoric prepared the British people for the battle that lay ahead. When Allied forces were trapped in their hundreds of thousands on the beaches of Dunkirk just weeks later, Prime Minister Churchill was as good as his word. While Hitler's troops encircled the Allies, leaving them no escape, one of the most miraculous events of the war took place, with military and civilian personnel all playing their part. Beneath the very noses of Hitler and his generals, 300,000-plus Allied troops were evacuated from the beaches of northern France by a flotilla of ships, fishing boats and yachts, along with all manner of other seaworthy craft, and returned safely to Britain, ready to fight another day. It proved that the Nazis were not infallible, but while Britain celebrated and welcomed their troops home, Churchill was quick to warn the nation that with valuable artillery and weapons lost, and their French allies left to face the enemy alone, this was far from being a victory. But compared to the situation faced by the countries that had already been vanquished by Hitler's sudden blitzkrieg tactics, at least Great Britain had been preparing for war for nearly a year. Barrage balloons had been put up, factories had increased production, and as more and more men poured into the army, women had been stepping forward to take their places on the production lines as well as the nation's farms. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, volunteers from the Commonwealth and those fleeing countries now occupied by the Third Reich began pouring into Britain, ready to join the Allied cause. While all measures were taken for the defense of the nation, security was of paramount importance, and Churchill, fearing there may be spies amongst the foreigners living on British soil, demanded that all Germans, Austrians and Italians be interned without trial. He famously declared, Collar the lot. By the summer of 1940, thousands of foreigners had been sent to the Isle of Man to live in bed and breakfast accommodation and hotels that had been cordoned off into camps. It was a move that many criticized, and the vast majority of those interned were completely innocent. But with a bitter battle ahead, Churchill could not afford to take any risks. It was the first of many controversial moves that he'd make over the course of the war. By the beginning of July 1940, yet another difficult decision had to be made. With the majority of France under the control of the Germans' puppet regime, the Vichy government, there was a real risk that Hitler would use the French fleet the fourth largest naval force in the world against the British. The commander of the French Navy, Admiral Darlan, had given a personal guarantee to Churchill that this wouldn't happen, but the British Prime Minister was all too aware that Darlan may have no choice in the matter and such a dangerous threat could not be overlooked. Weary of Hitler's next move, just days before the Battle of Britain began, Churchill proved that he was determined to defeat the German Führer, whatever the cost. Codenamed Operation Catapult, a fleet of British warships from Gibraltar sailed to where the largest concentration of French naval power was based, at Morel Kabir in French Algeria. Their task was to take control of the French fleet. And although attempts were made to use diplomacy to secure the ships, the commanding admiral in Algeria refused to hand over control to the British. On Churchill's instructions, the British fleet opened fire. 1,297 French sailors were killed, with more than 350 left wounded. The desperate measures taken by the British Prime Minister triggered a huge debate in the House of Commons and, not surprisingly, also soured relations between the British and the French for some time. Nevertheless, what some considered to be ruthlessness on the part of Churchill served as a stark warning to Hitler that he had better not underestimate the British. It demonstrated that Great Britain was prepared to continue the fight against Nazi tyranny alone if necessary. And Churchill later declared that for high government circles in the United States, there was no more talk of Britain giving in. Interestingly, while all this was going on, Hitler had been convinced that after the evacuation of the troops at Dunkirk, the war was practically over and that the British defeated on the continent and with no European allies would soon agree to surrender. Although some members of Churchill's government, most notably the Foreign Secretary Lord Halifax, had been willing to negotiate with Hitler, Churchill's defiance in Algeria was a sign that Britain would never surrender without a fierce fight. So the gloves were off. Hitler was now in no doubt whatsoever that the British would have to be conquered by force if the Nazi domination of Western Europe was to be total. And with Churchill obstinately standing his ground back at Nazi headquarters, all attention was now focused on drawing up a plan of attack. As Hitler and his generals plotted, he hoped it would take no more than a month to bring Great Britain into line but his commanders were very wary of the problems that lay ahead. Invading an island was a very different proposition to storming across a borderline with tanks. During the Norwegian campaign of April 1940, 
the German naval forces had come close to being destroyed, and they stood a little chance of being a match for the powerful British Royal Navy if an invasion was launched. Grand Admiral Eric Ryder informed his Fuhrer that invading Great Britain could only be considered as a last resort, and only then if the Luftwaffe had neutralized the RAF to give Germany supremacy in the air. So the decision was taken to direct all efforts towards the destruction of the Royal Air Force in the first phase of Operation Sea Lion, the codename for the invasion of Britain. Then, when the RAF had been destroyed, a massive sea and airborne assault along the length of the south coast could take place, and this would then be followed by a full-scale invasion. 100,000 troops, along with Heinrich Himmler's terror force, the SS, would storm into Britain with orders to destroy all opposition. The responsibility that now lay with the RAF was immense, and despite it being the oldest independent air force in the world, having been founded in 1918, the policy of appeasement that had prevailed during the 1930s had meant it was far from being as prepared for war as the German Luftwaffe. The focus had been on building bombers rather than fighters to defend the country. It wasn't until 1938 that fighter command was given full priority. Air Chief Marshal Dowding, in charge of British Fighter Command since its formation in 1936, had very little time to prepare for the battle that lay ahead. The RAF's main weakness was a shortage of experienced pilots, especially after the Battle of France and the losses incurred during the evacuation of Dunkirk. Farm boys, teachers, doctors, bank clerks and shop assistants Alongside hundreds of other young men with everyday jobs, little training and virtually no combat experience were now called upon to face the rigorously trained Luftwaffe pilots. Nevertheless, they were being led by experienced commanders who certainly knew what was required. First World War ace Air Vice Marshal Keith Park from New Zealand was responsible for defending the southeast of England and the critical London approaches. Park's No. 11 Group would bear the brunt of the attacks, while Air Vice Marshal Trafford Lee Malloroy commanded No. 12 Group, covering the Midlands and East Anglia, playing an equally vital role. The main German attack came from two Luftwaffe air fleets, commanded by Field Marshals Albert Kesselring and Hugo Spell. However, although the Luftwaffe had many more aircraft and experienced pilots than their British counterparts, the outcome was anything but a foregone conclusion. For a start, the German air fleets had not been designed to fight in their own right, but to support the army on land operations. The tactic had been used brilliantly in the conquest of Western Europe, the famous Blitzkrieg attacks. But being given total responsibility for a battle was a huge undertaking for the Luftwaffe. The Battle of Britain was the first campaign to be fought solely in the air and all previous rules of engagement no longer applied. Equally, the Germans also faced the major disadvantage of fighting a battle far away from their home bases, leaving them little time to spend in the skies over Britain, with refueling always a major issue. During an air battle, if a German plane was hit, the pilot, if not killed, was immediately captured. Whereas the British pilots could parachute onto home territory 
and fly to fight another day. For the Nazis, what on paper had looked to be straightforward was anything but, as the Luftwaffe quickly realized what they were up against. There had been German air raids made on Britain since 1939, but nothing on this scale. Luftwaffe bombers had been shot down over the Forth of Firth and Scarpa Flow in mid-November 39, and during further attacks in the new year. But as Churchill and the nation watched and waited for Hitler's next move, on July the 10th, 1940, the Battle of Britain began in earnest. Wave after wave of Nazi fighter-escorted bombers headed for the ships and harbours of the south of England. Despite being vastly outnumbered, five squadrons of Hurricanes and Spitfires rose from the runways and took to the skies to challenge Germany's modern state-of-the-art planes. With unsurpassed bravery and courage, the pilots gave their all for king and country in an epic battle of Churchill's David against Hitler's Goliath. Incredibly, the Germans lost twice as many planes as the British. And contrary to Hitler's belief, the Luftwaffe soon discovered that they had a major fight on their hands. Not only were they up against the sheer bravery and determination of the enemy pilots, but the British also had a revolutionary top-secret technology that would make a major contribution to the outcome of the battle. What would later become known as radar gave British controllers early warning of Luftwaffe raids as the great towers scanned the skies along the English coast and out to sea. And further inland, the British Observer Corps continued to employ more traditional methods, peering heavenward day and night, ready to phone control command as soon as an enemy aircraft came into view. Both the Observer Corps and radar provided an invaluable part of Britain's defence, as the controllers who watched at the tables 24 hours a day would send out warnings to the nearest fighter bases as enemy planes came into sight, so they in turn would be ready to fly into action. Soon the Luftwaffe began to wonder why these Spitfires and Hurricanes were always waiting for them. Nonetheless, they continued to underrate the value of the radar towers. Ironically, back in 1939, just before war broke out, the Germans had sent the airship Graf Zeppelin on a spy mission to scour the British airwaves for radar transmissions. While the vast airship flew up and down the east coast, British radar operators saw the largest echo they had ever witnessed appear on their screens. But the German scientists on board were oblivious to the commotion below and concluded that radar in Britain was in fact primitive and inefficient. As the airship floated back to the fatherland, radar wasn't the only thing German intelligence had failed to pick up on. In the heart of the Buckinghamshire countryside at Bletchley Park, code breakers were working day and night to decipher messages sent through the German Enigma machines. The Nazis transmitted their most secret and tactical information coded through Enigma and Project Ultra was dedicated to decrypting the messages. Eventually, Ultra-intelligence became so successful 
that the British had to ration its use to avoid undermining Nazi confidence in their Enigma machines. The Germans would only discover the extent to which the Polish and British cryptographers had broken the Enigma codes after the war. But while ultra-intelligence was helping the battle on the home front, further afield, there were threats that Ultra could not be of any assistance with in any way. With the remnants of Queen Victoria's empire, the British still had colonies in all corners of the globe, having once been the largest formal empire the world had ever known, with its power and influence stretching far and wide. As the Axis tightened its grip, outposts of the empire from the Far East to the deserts of North Africa, as well as territory in the Mediterranean, were all coming under threat. As a result, Britain had a great deal more than the home front to be concerned about. On the other side of the globe, Japan had long been waiting to seize its opportunity to create an empire on the scale of the great dominions of the British and the French. Up until now, Tokyo's focus had been on China, and since 1937, Japanese armies had been plunging deeper into its territory, seizing land and cities, terrorizing the civilian population. While the Chinese continued to counter the attacks and tales of atrocities grew, there was increasing sympathy for China's plight from abroad, and Britain and the US were doing all they could to send aid and supplies for the war effort. Nevertheless, the battle between China and Japan was prolonged and brutal, and by 1940 still showed no signs of coming to a close. By now, the Japanese had seized territory on the south coast of China, cutting the provisional capital Chongqing off from the sea, and it was becoming increasingly difficult for aid to get through. Only a few tenuous supply routes were left, and Tokyo's generals were eager that they be cut off as soon as possible, so that the battle for southern China could be swiftly won. One of these routes was the Burma Road, which ran from Lashio in the north of British-controlled Burma to the Chinese city of Kunming. Japan demanded that Churchill have it closed with immediate effect. Britain was in a difficult and vulnerable position, as some of its most valuable colonies, including Hong Kong and Singapore, were in the Far East, and with the Battle of Britain in full swing, could not afford to spare precious ships for their defence. Japan certainly seemed to have the upper hand, already having taken advantage of the Germans' victory in France by putting pressure on French Indochina to close their routes into China and it appeared that the British were now equally helpless to protect their interests. Prime Minister Churchill had a grave decision to make, and for the time being at least he had no other options open, forcing him to reluctantly agree to Japanese demands. On July the 17th, the Burma Road was temporarily closed amid cries of shame from the politicians in the House of Commons. And while these events were taking place, in Africa, yet another belligerent was making his presence felt. The Italian dictator, and Nazi Germany's ally Benito Mussolini, was keen to expand Italian territory and had already begun the task of creating a new Italian empire. In 1936, he had seized Abyssinia in East Africa, today known as Ethiopia, and had added the nation to his already established colonies of Italian Somaliland, namely Somalia and Eritrea. In North Africa, the Italians already held Libya, and Mussolini was now plotting to capture the valuable ports of Egypt and the Suez Canal, so he could link up his forces in Libya with those in Italian East Africa. Britain was in a better position in Africa than in the Far East, however, and was already one step ahead. When Mussolini declared war on Britain after the evacuation of Dunkirk, 30,000 Allied troops had stormed into Libya on June the 14th, signalling the start of the North African campaign. 
After capturing Fort Capuzzo on June the 16th, winning the first tank battle in the Western Desert at the Battle of Djerba, it seemed that for the time being Egypt and the Suez Canal were secure in Allied hands. Meanwhile, in East Africa, the Italians were enjoying rather more success, and after some minor incursions into British territory in the Sudan and Kenya, in August 1940, the Italians and their German allies attacked British Somaliland. In response, the British garrison were evacuated by sea to Aden, a French protectorate, and Mussolini was left to celebrate his first victory over Britain and the Empire. As the Luftwaffe continued their bombardment of Britain, Adolf Hitler also had an eye on the British colonies. The island of Gibraltar had been under British rule since the 18th century and served a vital role in both the Atlantic and Mediterranean theatre, controlling virtually all naval traffic into and out of the Mediterranean Sea from the Atlantic Ocean. While continuing preparations for Operation Sea Lion, Hitler began planning to seize the British colony, which would close the Mediterranean to British shipping, leaving merchant ships a long and perilous route along a U-boat-infested Atlantic highway. The operation was codenamed Felix, and if it succeeded, would put greater pressure on the British mainland as they struggled to fight off the Luftwaffe attacks. Hitler did, however, have one obstacle to overcome, the attack would have to be launched from Spain, and to do this, he would have to win the allegiance of the Spanish dictator, General Franco. Franco was as yet poised gingerly on the edge of the European conflict, and was not as eager as the Italian dictator Mussolini to make an alliance with the Nazi Fuhrer. In return for his help, Franco told Hitler he wanted Gibraltar, French Morocco, part of Algeria including Oran, as well as oil and full compensation for the cost of a British blockade. Whether by design or not, Franco's demands were beyond what Hitler was prepared to pay, and throughout the war he would continue to thwart the Nazi leaders' plans. By the time negotiations with Spain were concluded, Hitler would famously tell the Italian dictator Mussolini that he would prefer three or four of his teeth pulled out than to speak to Franco again. Unable to use Gibraltar to create his blockade, and still unable to bring the Battle of Britain to a swift conclusion, as more and more Luftwaffe planes were being shot down, Hitler now decided to step up the attack. It was time to collect together all the forces he could muster to obliterate the RAF and the nation's air defences to crush the British spirit once and for all. On August 1st, 1940, Hitler ordered the German Minister of Aviation, Hermann Göring, to summon all the might of the Luftwaffe to overpower the RAF in the shortest time possible, so preparations for Operation Sea Lion could be completed. The date for the invasion was set for September the 15th, but before that could happen, the RAF had to be beaten. As the battle commenced, 1,485 plane sorties were flown against the ports and airfields of southern England, and although British Fighter Command gave their all, the losses in the skies, damage to airfields on the ground, brought the RAF to the very brink of defeat. With no choice but to fly by day and night, the British pilots were exhausted, and as the bombs continued to fall, a Nazi victory seemed imminent. On August the 16th, while the battle raged, Winston Churchill visited No. 11 Group's operations room and was deeply moved by the valour of the young men fighting in the skies. He was so overcome with emotion, he could barely speak, 
but the words he did utter would become the basis of his speech to the House of Commons four days later when he praised the bravery of the RAF. The gratitude of every home in our island, in our empire, and indeed throughout the world, except in the abodes of the guilty, goes out to the British airmen who, undaunted by odds, unwearied in their constant challenge and mortal danger, are turning the tide of the world war by their prowess and by their devotion. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. And still the battles in the skies continued as the Luftwaffe ventured further inland, seeking to destroy RAF bases and industrial targets where planes and other vital supplies were being produced. Many major airfields were seriously damaged, and those working in factories were now at great risk, but people were determined to do their bit for the defence of the nation and worked doggedly throughout the attacks so that the war effort never faltered. Meanwhile, more and more Polish pilots were joining the RAF to help with the fight against the Nazis. 303 Squadron would famously bring down more enemy planes than any other squadron during the Battle of Britain. But despite the resilience of the men fighting in the skies and the immense effort of all those working around the clock to support them, the margins were beginning to narrow and fighter command was beginning to struggle. The Luftwaffe came dangerously close to destroying Britain's air defence, but then suddenly there was a change in Hitler's battle plan. Hitler had made it clear that the civilian population of Britain should not be targeted without his express permission. When on August the 24th, a German bomber crew accidentally dropped their bombs on London, the consequences changed the course of history. Churchill's retaliation was swift, and the very next day, British bombers were loaded and sent to Germany to exact revenge on Berlin. Despite there being little damage inflicted upon the city in the air raids, the psychological effect on the German people was dramatic. Hermann Göring had given his assurance that the cities of the fatherland would not and could not be bombed. But it was a promise that he evidently couldn't keep. Hitler was furious and it seemed that he allowed anger to colour his military strategy. The Führer was determined to avenge the attack on Germany and ordered that bombing now be focused with immediate effect on Britain's cities rather than fighter command and its airfields. Unbeknown to Hitler, he had given the RAF the respite that they desperately needed, but as the Blitz got underway, it was the people of Britain who would find themselves under attack. On the 7th of September 1940, in the late afternoon, sirens began to wail across the British capital as enemy planes were spotted flying towards London. As the warning rang out, people began rushing for safety, hurrying to the basements of buildings or guided to the nearest air raid shelters. Then, as the streets and buildings fell silent, a blanket of bombers two miles wide were seen flying up the Thames and the onslaught began. 348 German bombers 
escorted by 617 fighters, swarmed above the city, and with moments, bombs began to scream through the air, shattering the car. The RAF fighters who flew to defend the capital were overwhelmed, as in the words of one squadron leader, the sky became a seething cauldron of airplanes. London was thrown into complete and utter turmoil. But while explosions continued, there were even graver concerns troubling Churchill's war cabinet. Reconnaissance flights over the French Channel ports from Le Havre to Calais had shown a substantial build-up of barges that very same week, and with moonlight favouring a landing that very night, it seemed increasingly likely that the invasion of Britain was about to take place. As the Blitz began, the decision was taken to issue the code word Cromwell nationwide, which meant that invasion was imminent. The forward coastal divisions were put on alert all over the country, and coastal artillery sites were manned as those charged with the defence of the realm donned steel helmets and waited for the first sight of the enemy. Home Guard units manned their pillboxes, but panic started to set in, and some began ringing church bells, believing that the Nazis had already landed. As the sound of bells silenced since the outbreak of the Battle of Britain began to echo throughout the land, the Nazi threat suddenly seemed very real and truly terrifying. Back in London by 6pm, the first wave of bombers, having dealt their deadly blows, departed. But two hours later, while firefighters battled the blazes raging through the city, a second group of 133 raiders, guided by the flames of London burning, continued the onslaught throughout the night. People cowered underground as the earth shuddered and shook with no idea of what awaited them above. The second attack lasted until 4.30 in the morning. By daybreak, when people began to emerge from their shelters, many were met by scenes of utter devastation. As the search for survivors amongst the rubble began, it was soon revealed that over 400 people had been killed and more than three times that number had been injured. However, despite the human tragedies for the people of London, to the relief of those watching the coast, there was still no sign of the Nazi barges and it was clear that for the time being at least, Operation Sea Lion had yet to be launched. Then, in true British style, as the dust began to settle, the Sunday roast was cooked, whether at home or in a neighbour's oven, tea was brewed, and morale did not waver. Meanwhile, a classic radio broadcast from Churchill praised the fighting spirit of Londoners as they survived the first terrible days and nights of the Blitz, serving notice that Hitler's bullying tactics would never shatter the British resolve. For the next 57 days consecutively, London was bombed either during the day or throughout the night, and the fires raged relentlessly. Germany began to target many other cities, from Coventry and Cardiff to Belfast and Birmingham, with attacks that were devastating. Within a few weeks, the daily bombing sorties had become nightly raids, as Hitler tried to weaken the spirit of the British by depriving them of their sleep. But while the onslaught continued, the British fought back in every way that they could. <laughs> 
the government tried to confuse the German bombers by enforcing a blackout. Street lamps were switched off, car headlights had to be covered, and air raid wardens would ensure that everyone kept their lights off or concealed behind blackout curtains. Shelters were built in gardens, and as the bombing intensified, people began to gather in underground stations to sleep. As the war continued, whole communities began to develop the most extraordinarily strong sense of unity. Shops still opened despite being surrounded by the rubble of neighboring buildings, and those fortunate enough to find their houses still standing rallied to help those who had not been quite so lucky. The way the British coped with the onslaught was admirable, and despite their disturbed sleep in London, people continued to get up and go to work in the factories, determined to supply the commander of the RAF, Sir Hugh Dowding, with the planes and ammunition his fighter pilots so desperately needed. People from all walks of life stood shoulder to shoulder in the fight against Hitler. Despite fears for their safety, the king and queen were determined to remain at Buckingham Palace, showing solidarity with the British people. They even travelled around the country to boost morale and console those who had lost homes and loved ones. Buckingham Palace suffered no less than nine direct hits during the war, but once the palace had been bombed, the queen said that she could at least look the people of the East End in the eye rather than shattering the nation's morale, directly attacking the monarchy had quite the opposite effect. The British were heartened that their royal family shared their suffering and the kingdom was united. As the Battle of Britain and the Blitz continued, back in Germany controversy had been growing over the planned invasion of the United Kingdom and Operation Sea Lion with the army and navy unable to agree on a landing procedure. Hitler's faith in the plan seemed to be wavering, and the invasion date was postponed from the 15th of September until later in the month. Even so, on September the 15th, Goering launched his final major offensive to destroy RAF Fighter Command. However, with the help of ultra-intelligence, the RAF were forewarned of the attack, and in the end, the Luftwaffe lost 60 aircraft to the RAF's 28. It was to be the last engagement of the Battle of Britain. After this defeat, Operation Sea Lion was called off, and with sea conditions deteriorating as winter approached, it would be spring before it could even be considered again. The Battle of Britain was over. But Hitler would continue his efforts to bomb the nation into submission. During the Blitz, some two million houses were destroyed, with 60,000 civilians killed, and many more were injured. Elsewhere in the world, the threat of fascism and tyranny was spreading at an alarming rate. By September the 13th, Mussolini had revived his invasion plans in North Africa and ordered the Italian 10th Army to advance on Egypt. Within two weeks on the other side of the globe, the Japanese had invaded French Indochina and were ready to agree a formal alliance with Nazi Germany. On September the 27th, 1940, the Axis powers united in Berlin as Japan signed the Tripartite Pact, joining Germany and Italy in the fight against the Allied forces. Hitler, who was already planning to renege on his non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union, had not invited Stalin. Russia was destined to become another target in Hitler's conquest for world domination, but for the time being, defeating the British remained his major objective. The war in Europe was reaching global proportions, but Britain's fight to stave off the Nazi attacks had been admired across the world. And as the words of Winston Churchill, we shall never surrender, reverberated around the globe, they would provide inspiration 
not only for the people of Britain, but also for every occupied nation terrorized by the Nazi regime. However, the British would not have to stand alone for much longer, as the consequences of Hitler's tripartite pact would directly bring the Americans into the conflict, at last making the Allies a real force to be reckoned.